two, one. Hello, everybody. My name is Natalie Gonchi, and welcome to the tenth uh, read uh, tenth uh, webinar of the Appeal uh, Lab here in the University of Lisbon. Uh, today we have two speakers, and our first speaker is Sofia Michens, who is full professor in modern and contemporary philosophy at the University of Porto. And there she is also the director of the Institute of Philosophy and the head of the Mind, Language and Action Research Group. She is the former president of the Portuguese Philosophical Association, and she has been a visiting researcher at New York University, the Institut Johnny Show in Paris, the University of Sydney, the University of Picardy in Amiens. Sophia has authored and edited books on contemporary philosophy and philosophy of science with focus on philosophy of language, mind, knowledge, and rationality. And she has uh, most recently published an anthology on the logical alien with Harvard University Press. Today, she will talk on a paper that she did for a special issue that we are editing for Topoi on language and worldviews. And um, that is is an outgrowth of a satellite event that we did in uh, Proto Language uh, uh, in 2019 here in Lisbon. And um, so her paper there uh, in the special issue for Topoi is on animal brains and the works of words. Uh, Daniel Dennett on natural language and the human mind. And so today she will uh, present us that paper. Sophia, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Natalie, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so as, as Natalie said, I'm going to present a summary of my article on Dennett, published in the Language and World Views uh, top, a, top a issue uh, edited by Natalie and Selena Arfini, I see here, I think. We exchanged <laughs> lots of emails before. Diana Cote, Matteo Fontaine, and Lorenzo Magnin. Thank you for, for the opportunity. So I'll be talking about Dennett. And um, I believe Dennett has a number of challenging and provocative ideas about language, which bear uh, on a wide range of, range of issues, from mind to ontology. And one main claim of his, uh, to which I'll be going uh, back to uh, several times today, is that natural language is an evolved tool for communication, originating in behavioral habits um, users were initially not aware of. Such habits changed access to information within individual human brains, and so changed conditions of self-access, as it were, access to oneself uh, in humans. And it was as such that they were crucial for the evolution of human consciousness. Now, uh, language, language and consciousness, consciousness are naturally main topics in philosophy and most often dealt with in a way very different than Dennett's. Suffice it to think of discussions of phenomenal consciousness in analytic philosophy or discussions of language and ontology, say around Frege or Wittgenstein. Uh, and for many people uh, involved in those discussions, uh, all of what follows what that I'll be talking about here would be regarded as wildly psychologistic, wildly speculative. This is not something, uh, well, Bennett, I suppose, is used to being <laughs> received as such in many quarters of uh, analytic philosophy. I will try to stress what I think is the provocative aspect of Bennett's work as a kind of insider outsider uh, in analytic philosophy. Um, uh, one main re reference of my article for the top I issue was the 2017 book From Bacteria to Bach, the Evolution of Minds. And for those of you here who may be more familiar with uh, Dennett's work, um, this is the post-real patterns Dennett, uh, having espoused what he sees as metaphysical realism regarding the mental after his initial instrumentalist or interpretivist position. And it's also post-memes Dennett. He started using the controversial concept of memes. Here I will concentrate uh, on how Dennett's views stand opposed to approaches to language and mind that are very important for philosophy, namely the representational computational theory of mind of Jerry Fowler and uh, Noam Chomsky's idea of a universal grammar, two specific forms of universalism regarding mind and language, and also to Paul Grice's internalist and intentionalist conception of meaning and communication. I will also briefly sketch how Dennett relates his view of language with views of consciousness and ontology, which may seem respectively outrageously deflationary and at least apparently uh, re relativist, maybe uh, not so. At least not according to, to Dennett. <clears throat> now, Dennett is 
a philosopher by trade, but his positions on language are, we might say, quite close in spirit to evolutionary approaches to thinking and to language acquisition and development of people such as, you see there are pictures there, Michael Tomazell or Derek Rickerton or Morton Christiansen. The core concept of Dennett's physicalist and non-reductionist position on mind is that of the intentional stance. From his uh, early publications to the most recent, became, Dennett became more and more explicitly Darwinian in formulating uh, such uh, positions. Uh, as formulated from within the philosophy of mind and regarding locating mind in the world, the intentional stance, Dennett's intentional stance, is a viewpoint from which physical systems are attributed beliefs and desires and their behavior uh, predict predicted. Then it contrasts then it contrasts the intentional stance on systems with the physical stance and the design stance. As, as he puts it in From Bacteria to Bach, the intentional stance, sorry, the intentional stance works for designed, uh, for designed systems or systems designed to use information to accomplish function. So treating a physical system as a rational agent works as, a short, uh, as an explanatory shortcut relative to e.g. an account resorting to laws of physics. Then its philosophy of psychology or philosophy of mind is built on a conception of the relations between these three stances on which there is, and that's what will matter more here, there is no self-standingness of something like a representational level, unlike what is the case for Fodor or Chomsky. So as we may put it by saying that for there to be mind, there need, need, no, need not be representations and sich. Um, a central assumption in everything uh, that it does is that the intentional st sense works for design system and the, uh, and the general uh, theory of design is naturally for Dennett Darwinism. So the idea of natural uh, selection as a substrate neutral mindless algorithm for moving through design space in his words, for instance, in Darwin's dangerous idea. So um, also uh, important for Dennett is the fact that the explanatory scheme of Darwinism, so incremental random variability, natural selection and inheritance stands for both biological and non-biological physical design systems. From, um, sorry. From a philosophical viewpoint, what makes uh, Darwin's idea dangerous and Dennett always insists for his philosophical uh, readers on this uh, danger posed by uh, Darwin's idea is that it corrodes essentialism and teleology in thinking about evolved entities, whether these evolved entities be biological organisms, uh, biological species, cultural artifacts, or uh, human uh, consciousness. Evolution by natural selection makes it possible to account for complex systems with, with purpose or function without need for a designer. So uh, new objects or entities come to be through blind processes of cop copying, combination, selection. This is so not only with organisms, but also with minds, mental skills and culture, uh, human and animal. And so for then it, the evolution of minds, the evolution of minds is a story which uh, in his terms, a story in which competence requiring little or no comprehension, as well as what he calls free floating rationales, so reasons for the coming to be of new design, which are no one's reasons, play a major role. So in the evolution of minds, natural language was crucial, according to Dennett, for the difference between human minds and other kinds of minds. Uh, human minds are self minds, minds where a mind's eye came to be and conscious minds, uh, minds which eventually brought in comprehension as well as owned reasons into the Darwinian story. This is how Dennett likes to, likes to put uh, things. Still, although our kind of mind, unlike other kinds of minds, is now marked by conscious understanding, the, that was definitely not how uh, the minds in the physical world uh, started. As for, sorry. As for our own conscious understanding, according to Dennett, words were uh, fundamental for its coming uh, to be. Notice that Dennett speaks always of words when he speaks of language. He doesn't 
favor speaking of uh, of sentences like uh, or, or propositions like uh, most analytic philosophers philosophers of language uh, namely uh, would do he speaks of words and he thinks words are as he always puts it the best example of memes so he uh, if we compare it say with Chomsky he, he would resort to words and memes uh, where Chomsky would resort to sentences and grammar uh, and uh, what he means when he says that words are fundamental for the coming to be of conscious understanding is that phenomena, phenomena such as self-admonition, self-appreciation, self-exoneration, committed assertion or lying, all phenomena involving words um, were essential for the centralized and own mental lives of humans. But still the, the rationale uh, for words was not this talking to oneself, which is uh, what then, in a very Rylian vein, uh, thinks now thinking, our own thinking is. The rationale was communication among uh, humans. Such appeal to communication at the origins of language, uh, so the use of information tools among uh, uh, individuals, among humans, contrasts with Jerry Folder's influential idea of uh, a language of thought. According to Fodor, there is a language of thought underlying all natural language, you say, Portuguese, Korean, Chinese, French, others. Fodor's language of thought hypothesis was one central philosophical development of the representational computational view of mind and appeared, in, if we look back to the history of cognitive science and philosophy, in the studies of cognition in the 1960s uh, against behaviorism. Uh, the language of thought is what kind of language is the language of thought? In what sense is the language of thought supposed to be language? It is a universal internal system of real representations. You might put it like that. It's a code. It's not to be identified with language as I am speaking English now. So language as we conscious human agents use in belief or justification, language as say epistemology study language. It is a symbolic and computational medium uh, for thought. Like uh, Chomsky's universal grammar, Fodor's language of thought is uh, not only internal, he, he takes it to be uh, uniquely uh, human. Fodor's main interest in claiming that thinking, our thinking occurs uh, in mental language, in what he calls mental ease, is to claim that thought, like language, has syntax and is, this, uh, is thus compositional and systematic. His compositionality papers would be a, a good place to go check the, the gist of, uh, of these claims. These claims. So Fodor's uh, way of arguing for a language of thought is, we might say, close in spirit to Noam Chomsky's case for universal grammar. According to Chomsky's poverty of stimulus argument, human children uh, are never exposed to enough uh, evidence. They do not hear enough grammatical language or hear enough grammatical language corrected to know what they come to know about language, the language that they speak. So they could not have learned it from experience. They could not have learned it by trial and error. They could not have learned the complex and systematic rules of language that they speak by experience. So there has to be something like an innate universal grammar, an innate language acquisition device. Same for the compositional and systematic language like nature, nature of thought for Fodor. And Fodor thinks that um, there has to be uh, then um, a language uh, of thought. Um, not at all the case for Dennett. Dennett sees things very differently. I'm using the, the Hauser Shomsky Tekumsefich question, what is language, who has it? Um, and then it sees things very differently than, than Folder or, or Shomsky when it comes to, to these questions. Uh, starting from his uh, approach to the mental from the intentional stance or, or taking his approach to the mental, uh, which has the intentional stance as reference, then it sees things very differently. First of all, uh, he set, sees human minds and other kinds of minds on par, on par as beings in the world predictable from the intentional stance. Um, and as for language, uh, it was words way informational tools which were first out there, as he puts it, as behavioral habits used by our ancestors uh, in their ongoing doings in the environment, unaware of what they were doing. Words, Dennett says, are uh, uh, were replicable habits, and they simply infected, that's the term he uses, the brains of our ancestors. 
that did not happen for the benefit of their hosts. And in fact, speaking to oneself, which is, as I said, what now thinking is, according to Dennett, was a later further step, a step of great enhancing power uh, in the evolution uh, of human minds. In contrast with Bennett, notice that neither Chomsky nor Fodor um, appeals to evolution in thinking about language. Not that they see evolutionary science as a foe, they simply do not see it as the right tool to deal with the nature of language. For Chomsky, it is very clear that uh, the right tool to deal with the nature of language are grammars. Um, and what we need are formal mathematical uh, models uh, and not uh, evolutionary um, models. Uh, if you want to have a closer look at a, a text that I think it's pretty illuminating about all this, um, Fodor's uh, part four uh, of compositional papers on philosophical Darwinism is um, be an interesting uh, reading. Views such as Fodor's and Chomsky's on the language of thought and on universal grammar boil when we look closely down to universalist assumptions about the human mind and about its uh, uniqueness. And it's precisely this, it's precisely, uh, precisely that, that Bennett is reluctant to, to acknowledge or to think is the case. So he's reluctant to attribute such a degree of cognitive entrenchment and commonality to something like a single universal internal level of representations and call it a language or call it a, a grammar. Uh, this is also um, a, a position, then it's positions uh, regarding cognition and uh, explaining, explaining cognition and the kind of units one needs uh, in order to explain cognitions. Fodor, very uh, clearly, it's at the center of uh, his work in philosophy of mind, believes that the language of thought explains cognition and that we need the language of thought hypothesis to explain cognition. Okay, like Fodor, then it believes that mind reading which is, we might say, a, a starting phenomenon for both, is indeed the fundamental capacity of humans. But he sees this capacity of mind reading as based on the global behavior of the organism and not on mental language. So beliefs and desires, which are for further uh, uh, internal uh, mental states uh, that are to be related to a language of thoughts, beliefs and design, desires are for Bennett to be attributed to the whole organism from the intentional stance. Mindedness attributed from the intentional stance is what mind is for Bennett. There is no intrinsically symbolic internal code independent of the real world, world behavior of agents, uh, which would, would in turn serve as a medium for psychological explanation. Rationality and mindedness characterize the agent as a whole in its relation to the environment. So the reference is, as it were, the being in the world of the agent. No representations there, then it would put it like this, there's no representations without representing. Um, we, and, and who does the representing is uh, an agent, uh, agent in the world. So uh, for our purpose regarding what is language, who has it, and what are we to make of many of natural languages for Bennett, there is no language deeper than natural language as it is used among humans. In, in humans, language is simply not a, a subpersonal phenomenon. And this is, as it were, the starting point for Dennett's attempt to understand the evolutionary origins of natural language by focusing on uh, communication. So now um, I said I would refer to, uh, to Father Shomsky and Grice, now uh, Grice. Um, in philosophy of language, we usually introduce matters of communication and pragmatics by appealing to Grass, Paul Grass, and his views on natural meaning and non-natural meaning. Uh, so it's important to realize what Dennett thinks of Grass. What does Dennett think of Grass? In his own words, ordinary human conversation is conducted in a space of possibilities governed by Grassian free-floating rationalities. I may not expressly intend that you recognize my intention to get you to believe that what I'm saying is true or that it, that it is irony or that it is kidding or transparent exaggeration. But if you are not up to that kind of recognition and if you are not up to originating speech acts having similar free floating rationales that explain your own responses and challenges, you will not be a convincing or engaging 
conversationalist. You will not be a human using language. Bennett does not think that Grice's claims about non-natural meaning, the sort of claims that we find uh, in, uh, in the philosophy of language textbook, he does not think that Bennett, that Grice's claims are true of natural language, or that something like, say, the Sperber and Wilson uh, theory of communication uh, is the right step to take when it comes to building a theory of uh, human language and human uh, communication. Um, actually, he would doubt that there can be such a theory and would ask in what way would that be a theory. Um, notice that, say, Sperber and, and Wilson, a uh, famous work on communication, um, Gratian, uh, work on, on, uh, Gratian expired work on communication itself, it focuses on neither actual personal workings of cognition nor on consciousness. Their goal is to build something like an abstract, timeless model of uh, communication and use it. And this is not the way to go uh, according, uh, according to, to Dennett. Um, Gricean iterated layers of intention. Gricean iterated layers uh, of intention are not real-time features underlying actual linguistic performances, like me speaking now. Everyday communication, Dennett uh, says, it is in his 2017 book, is hugely un-Gricean. So, um, and, and he also adds, if Grice's analysis uh, were uh, a performance theory, to, they would be applicable to only a small minority of, of speakers in, in only very particular occasions. So why does Grice swing right? That's more or less how Bennett uh, puts the, the question. And, and his answer is that it rings right because what Grice does is to reverse engineer the phenomenon of human linguistic communication as it evolved. Uh, Grice pointed out the free-floating rationales of the cultural and genetic evolution of use of words by humans. And this, for Bennett, is exactly the right perspective from which to approach um, language. Now, uh, as I said, this is the, uh, as it were, philosophical reference to um, uh, approach communication from uh, an evolutionary uh, viewpoint. Um, so the question would be, how and to what purpose did human linguistic communication um, evolve? And this, the answers, I uh, will sketch some bits of Dennett's uh, approach to this, and I will try not to have an opinion about whether this is philosophy or, or theory of cognition. Anyway, it's a view of intelligence. It's a view of intelligence in a physical world. And it is, it is done assuming that intelligence in the physical world has to be made of many stupid parts. And this is how then it approaches language, culture, and cultural evolution, and uh, ultimately human linguistic uh, communication. Uh, so, then it's uh, views um, start with um, the use of what he calls proto words. And he also likes to call them proto labelings and proto requests. And um, he uh, goes on describing these proto words, proto labelings, proto requests as part of his views on the origin of human culture and cultural evolution, which he sees as a process of ubiquitous gradualness, and he approaches armed with the notion of means. Uh, there's many problems, as we all know, with the notion of means. Uh, that it has been criticized for being vague, for being useless, for being unspecific. Uh, if, uh, if we want to look at some uh, criticisms that, uh, done by authors with whom Dennett engaged, for instance, Dan, Dan Sperber would, uh, would be um, a good source. Uh, but uh, I just want to point out why Dennett then, then resorts to this notion of meme uh, in this context of um, uh, evolutionary um, origins of language qua communication. He resorts to the notion of meme in this context because he intends to avoid what he sees are uh, as the essentialist assumptions regarding relations between information, communication, language, and, and culture. His focus, which he thinks is the right focus to, uh, to have, is on design worth getting. And his questions are, 
when and how does the copying of information become or became more than just copying? When and how uh, does what started as a habit of copying become became uh, trial and error uh, learning? And when and how did culture as external transmission of new skills and habits to descendants and does more than simply individual trial and error come to be? And each of these steps, this is a qu the question he repeats, were, was better for whom? Cui bono, in the, in the Latin expression he always uh, uses. So who pro profits from it? Um, I think a, a useful way to navigate here is to ask ourselves, or to see then it, as asking himself, what the differences are between communication and copying of uh, information. Information moves from, say, A to B whenever B copies A. Uh, and you have this kind of phenomenon uh, with genes, with computers, but this is not per se learning yet, and it's much less culture than it points out. There certainly is animal learning. There are even animal traditions. Uh, he asks questions such as, how can animal parents impart habits and skills to their offspring? And this is the background that, against which uh, he proposes the idea that cultural transmission, which became the hallmark of human minds, would not have been possible without words, without uh, the prototype of memes that are words. So communication, as it came to be, uh, required require, requires more than copying, requires more than trial and error learning. It requires a, a Gricean embedded network of mental states attribution supporting the circulation and dissemination of uh, informational tools and such communicative habits made for according to them a snowballing effect, a snowballing effect. Uh, and language was thus, thus he says the launching pad and not the foundations of what now is human thinking proper such as what goes on mentally in, in each one of us now at this moment. And only once language was in the picture was, he says, cumulative cultural evolution enabled, rendering human thinking quite unique as we may now think uh, it is. So Bennett doubts that, say, religious rituals or Lascaux paintings would ever have been poss possible without use of language in this sense. And understanding how this was possible brings us back again to the idea of memes. So Bennett's Repeat constantly repeat, repeat claim is then that words are memes, and in fact, they are the, the best memes, although not the only ones. And he uh, explicitly says that he uses the word meme as a term for a way of behaving, a way of behaving that can be transmitted from host to host by being copied, as he, as he puts it, very much like a software app or applet. Uh, they are the memes in Bennett's terms. Uh, symbiont machinery, that's the expression he uses in from bacteria to back. So dependent on the reproductive machinery of their hosts, which they exploit for their own needs. They were one essential part in the process of evolution of human minds. And the other essential element, something which, which uh, a pro makes then it close to what we may see as externalist uh, approaches to mind, uh, another essential element in the evolution of culture and cultural evolution uh, was what he calls cognitive niche construction. Not, and, and very important in this idea of cognitive niche uh, construction is, is the fact for him that no, not all activities of animals are a um, mere response to the environment in the sense that animals do not learn internally only. They can also shape their environments, revise features of their environments, making it so that their descendants are born into importantly different environments. So cognitive niches where new selection pressures are present and others are relieved. So uh, then it sees the evolutionary history of humans as a succession of such cognitive niches filled with information accumulators, as he puts it, offloaded from uh, agents. And it was such niche construction, along with the circulation of word memes, which it's his proposal eventually made human minds as they now are possible, according to Bennett. So he sees human minds as they are now, as, I'm quoting, a blend of Darwinian bottom-up processes and top-down intelligent design. His suggestion then is that 
uh, human culture started out profoundly, profoundly Darwinian, bottom up, and then the exploration of design space, as he puts it, gradually did Darwinize, became top down. So when he mentions Bach, so the names of Picasso, Bach, or Turing, or Einstein in the From Bacteria to Bach uh, book uh, stand for such de Darwinization. They are examples of the kind of directed, controlled, authored, original human thinking and doing, which, which came to be possible only by being anchored on something completely different, something completely else, not directed, not controlled, not authored, not original, informational behavioral habits which preceded, uh, which preceded it. So the creativity of Bach or Einstein should in fact be seen as then it puts it as an echo in high speed and in concentrated form of the unthinking Darwinian research and development processes that created uh, comprehension in nature. So I just have a bit of water. I'm facing the sun. <laughs> it's almost impossible for me to see the screen. So now back to, to the work of words as memes and to a sort of recovery of Chomsky that Bennett does in the uh, From Bacteria to Bach Ideas. So um, as I said, Bennett sees or suggests we should see uh, proto words as silent behavioral habits, quite infectious and not yet domesticated. It's an expression he uses. And there were certainly plenty of catchy bad habits as such um, around. And then he says there was selective pressure in favor of um, organic modification that enhanced the process of language uh, acquisition. And at one point, he says, communicating linguistically became, in his words, an obligatory talent for our species. And this is where he thinks we should look at Chomsky um, anew. So basically thinks that Chomsky is not, uh, is not totally uh, wrong. Um, it is true, naturally, that the idea that the idea uh, of an innate universal grammar clashes with the gradualness of evolutionary processes. But uh, I, I have a quote here. Um, this is how then it suggests one might reconcile early and late uh, Chomsky. Um, the early Chomsky claimed that the universal innate language model, given its abstractness, given its complexity, might as well have come about by cosmic accidents. Chomsky enjoyed uh, repeating uh, this, since no evolutionary story could ever ha ever help capture its abstract nature. Yet in his minimalist program in the 90s, Chomsky had already dropped the uh, innate mechanisms of the earlier version of his linguistic theory. And he, in his uh, article with Hauser and Tecum in 2002, he seemed, to open, he seemed to have opened up to thinking about language in terms of, um, of evolution. The question remaining, of course, whether and how uh, natural selection uh, could be responsible for the notions that Chomsky uh, thinks are the keeps using in linguistic theory, in particular, the notion of, uh, of recursion and critics doubt that he has in fact, in fact, uh, open uh, such uh, door. Then it does agree that there's one problem here, but um, sorry, I don't know if I've ever already read the quotation. Um, no, we'll get, we'll get there. No, you um, did not. <laughs> yes, I, I, I have it in front of me, but I can't see it. <laughs> there's just too much, uh, too much. Um, summing up uh, Dennett's position uh, regarding uh, Chomsky. What uh, what he thinks is is wrong with uh, with a, a, a certain way of taking Chomsky's idea uh, about the innateness of the language acquisition de uh, device has to do with the, what he calls attraction to essences. So he thinks Chomsky and Chomsky and linguists remain attracted to essences, and this, according to um, to Dennett, is uh, what uh, uh, is problematic. And talk of essences is precisely what talk of memes is supposed to replace in thinking about uh, language. So we are getting, we are getting to the, the quote. So in approaching a question such as how much universal grammar is installed in the language acquisition device, 
we should, according to them, no, now these are his words, reconcile early and late Chomsky by saying that the intricate structures of specific rules and guiding principles are not so much explicit rules, but deeply embedded patterns in ways of speaking, so in communicative behavior that consist of a series of improvements br brought by evolution, both cultural and genetic, in response to the success of proto languages. There's only two things remaining of what I said the summary would be. Those two things are consciousness and and ontology. So how does this um, how does this connect? So we have meme hosts. Um, we have words as memes, and um, and we have evolution, and um, and we have interaction between humans in cognitive niches, um, in environments that are uh, not na natural uh, environments only, but where uh, there are cognitive niches available. Now, Dennett's question, which leads to his, the connection with all this, with his view on consciousness, is, is the following. He paraphrases Thomas Nagel and half ironically asks, what is it like for the pioneer meme hosts? They have their heads filled uh, with information. Did any of these tools, informational tools, make themselves known to their hosts, or did uh, these uh, informational tools, as it were, fly under uh, the radar? What then it suggests is that the use of word memes without any uh, realization of what was being done came first. Words simply did not make it into the manifest image of those who used them. So this is where Dennett uh, brings in Sellers, Wilfred Sellers, and his uh, notions of manifest uh, image and uh, scientific image. And I'll try to uh, briefly say how he does it. So manifest, so the question is the relation between words and the manifest image. And, and this will get us to uh, the relation between language quite communication and uh, quantum consciousness. So manifest image is American philosophers Wilfred Sellers term for how things are to us. And this is something Sellers contrasts with the scientific image, which is made up of our best scientific theories and how they tell us that the world is like. Uh, so, um, where do words uh, belong? Um, proto words, then it keeps repeating, passed between uh, early meme hosts, hosts without being not noticed. And he draws an interesting analogy here. Uh, he calls our attention to children's linguistic development. Children enter the order of language by only progressively gaining understanding of what they are doing by uttering words. They use words first without what we may call full understanding of uh, the meaning of those words. Um, and he uh, is, suggests that uh, something uh, analogous is um, what um, should have taken, have been the case in uh, the evolution of, uh, uh, of language. It's a bit difficult to know how to formulate then it's uh, hypothesis approaches. I mean, one doesn't really know. This is a bit like sellers and empiricists in the philosophy of, uh, of mind talking about our ancestors and how they, st they started manipulating words, but sellers is explicitly doing philosophy and then not, necess not necessarily uh, in between. So anyway, um, the natural home of word memes is now for us our manifest image, they are there for us, the, the, our words, not the scientific image where say vitamins or viruses or quarks uh, dwell. So scientific images what there is according to our best theories. And so the, the, the relevant question for Dennett is how did word memes come to be part of our manifest image, come to be part of what we are aware is there uh, for us? <clears throat> Most um, current memes are affordances we are equipped to notice. There are items in our ontology typically invisible to other animals, say uh, sentences in Portuguese or, or sentences in English, which are not there for our cat, cats or dogs. A meme, uh, then it, according to Dennett, is a way of beha behaving that can be transmitted from host to host by being uh, copied. And according to Dennett, the acquisition of language is now, for, for a human born now, something like the installation of a pre-designed software 
software app in that it is something most users never encounter as such. But and now we enter one of then it's just so stories, early world memes um, were visible or audible to others and to their hosts themselves. Uh, notice that we ourselves constantly monitor ourselves speaking. So to put it in that style, let us imagine that we ask ourselves, as we have in this slide, did I just say that? Did I really utter those words? And then a discovery might then take place. Oh, I can really mean uh, what I say. We can also imagine that there was a point, says Dennett, where the meme host realized, ah, I can find within myself the answer to the questions I was asking others. I don't need to ask them, others, the others anymore. And this, according to Dennett, uh, this is a just so story that um, accounts for the opening channels of communication within a mind. This was what made it the case, according to Dennett, that storage of information separately allocated, but to be used connectively. So a gradual process towards a conscious linguistic human mind, the mind like our own, a mind with a virtual center started with such internal uh, communication, according to Dennett. And we are getting to all that consciousness is for Dennett. So eventually such newly centralized humans started to, in his expression, own their means. Uh, the arrival of language set the stage uh, for the origin of comprehension, that unique human achievement. And for then it, human consciousness is no more than that. It simply amounts to the achievement of such global comprehension by connecting local, which, which came to be by connecting local non-comprehending competencies already uh, in place. Uh, one, um, sorry, I'm not going to use all the slides. There's not so much time to, to go. Uh, one important consequence of all this, according to Dennett, is that there is no line to be drawn between conscious minds and those which are not conscious. Uh, thinking that there is such a line, and I'm quoting Dennett in From Bacteria to Bach, is a pre-Darwinian way of seeing things. And that is, in fact, what Dennett thinks of uh, Thomas Nagel's criterion, what is it like to be? The question, what is it like to be, of which is often used in search for what Dennett calls an essence, in this case, an essence of consciousness, of consciousness as uh, uh, awareness, uh, forces an identification of consciousness with qualia or phenomenal consciousness. And according to Dennett, such philosophers' favorites as phenomenal consciousness or qualia are nothing but empty terms to be explained away. The supposed line between the it is like something to be and it is not like something to be should simply be replaced by a gradual evolutionary story. And again, quoting him. So there is no sharp line between mindedness and non-mindedness, just fuzzy borders. This is Dennett's proposal. Still, there is something, just uh, something on the side that's important about self-probing. There's something else that matters. Uh, we humans speak constantly about ourselves, about what it is like for us to be. And such introspective divulgences, as Dennett calls them, are conspicuous, he says, in every human form of life, now from members of Amazon tribes to quantum physicists. They are also observable behavior, and they are, in fact, a central feature of our manifest image. And such self-probing, often, often undertaken by linguistic means, is what is at stake in consciousness, in, in, according to Dennett. So the, the idea of probing and making it that there be, um, by means of such linguistic probes, uh, what he calls higher order mental uh, states anchored in uh, use of language. We can discuss then its view of consciousness further. This is a bit unfair, this, uh, this uh, short uh, <laughs> summary. Anyway, then its approach to consciousness is, as everyone knows, uh, utterly deflationary. And he sees his, uh, uh, is he sees consciousness, thinks consciousness should be just a part of the story of the evolution of cognition and culture. And um, eventually this will uh, amount to or turn around what he calls a language-based user illusion, which evolved in particular human brains with the help of linguistic self probes. So the, the quote from, uh, from Bacteria to, to Bach about consciousness, uh, human consciousness is a system of virtual machines that evolved genetically and memetically 
to play very specialized roles in the cognitive niche our ancestors have constructed over the millennia. The millennia. So quay intelligent conscious agents, we sit, sit on top of much unintelligent intelligence, we may put it like that. We speak and we spoke first for others. And this is what eventually made it that consciousness came to be uh, in humans. As then it, put it puts it, if we did not have to do it to speak to others, our brains would not have bothered produce the edited digest that is our stream of consciousness. Um, but we did speak to others and such communication is a kind of behavior which requires uh, an organism to self-monitor its own control system. And it was thus that we got an interface, a user illusion, recruiting something which existed initially for others uh, to our own use. And by such means, we now are, as it were, and this is then its expression, guests in our own uh, brains. We are there for ourselves as selves and language had a, a word to say in it. Uh, just a final word and then I move on to a brief conclusion around ontology. The first person point of view, consciousness, this is what Dennett is saying, is anchored in language and thus is anchored in the manifest image in humans and not in the scientific image. Yet it is to our best science that Dennett uh, ultimately is going to resort and it's uh, to our best science, so to the Cellarsian scientific image, that Dennett is trying to contribute with his views on mind and cognition and language. So he ultimately appeals to science to claim that the physicalist monism of the scientific image trumps and should trump the manifest image. This is paradoxical, as it were, in as much as it ultimately makes human first person perspective vanish from the scientific image. Uh, yet this is but one of the ontological difficulties that its philosophy faces. And I want to finish by just identifying or hinting at some others. I use the word ontology, and this is uh, Dennett's Quinianism interfering with this, uh, with his Salarsian vocabulary of manifest and image and scientific image. What does Dennett think ontologies are? And ontologies were on a, one of the interests of this, the, your special uh, issue. As Dennett sees it, the issue of ontologies is intimately necessarily connected with minds. Ontologies are simply words, worlds as they are for minds with what is in them. And there are many kinds of minds in Dennett's own expression. It's the title of one of his books, namely uh, Animal Minds. So if ontologies are worlds as they are for minds, and there are many kinds of minds, then it seems that there are as many ontologies as there are kinds of minds. And this seems like metaphysical pluralism, we might call it a many worlds view of what there is. Yet, is there not one world which underlies and connects all these worlds, all these ways of being, all these words for minds? Then it is clearly and explicitly attracted to this idea. So when pressed against the wall by his critics, he goes Quinean and ultimately identifies what there is with what there is according to our best science. And this is what he connects what he, with what he, from the viewpoint of philosophy, calls his physicalist monism. When it comes to ontology, science matters very much. And our manifest image is to be ultimately replaced uh, by, the, uh, by the scientific image. And the oneness of the world should thereby be uh, restored. This is what I would call the unstable status of physicalism in, Den in Dennett's uh, philosophy. Physicalism amounts to, um, I'm, I'm almost finishing, giving the last word to, to science. Uh, and thinking that there is one science which is basic and applies to everything there is, and that science is physics. There's many problems here for philosophers interested in ontology and metaphysics. And then it has been asked what his arguments in favor of physicalism exactly are. Uh, in terms of ontologies, we might, we might straight uh, ask why is science inherently better at world making than any other way by uh, other uh, mind, but, but human minds. Th then it's refraining from uh, a pluralist, sorry. Then it's refraining from a pluralist ontology is uh, problematic. In general, one might say, he says that ontologies are made up of objects and their properties. And he sees that the origin of such uh, ontologies, minds, different kinds of minds, 
as well as, according to his own evolutionary approach, engagement, engagement of one part of the world, an agent with another part of the world, an agent engaged with its environment in which there are affordances for it. This is the kind of vocabulary that Bennett accepts and takes. So according to Bennett's intentional stance, such engagement of one part of the world with another part of the world does not necessarily, as we saw before, involve representations and zish, so items which are intrinsically representations, like Fodor's language of thought uh, sentence. For then there is no representation without representers. Also, from the viewpoint of the intentional stance, the problem solved by a being in the world, so an agent, an animal, is not to accurately represent the world, mirroring the world as it were, but to represent it well enough so that the agent survives. So then it would simply accept such general claims about cognition, such as all representing is environment embedded all representative and action oriented. And hence the difference world making by different agents in the world and hence the, 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 the plural uh, ontologies. We are anyway left with the questions. Why should a particular form of world, why then should a particular form of world, world making by a particular kind of mind, ours, uh, doing science, be as it were more real than other ways of world making by other minds. Why should only human minds producing human science and the scientific image be the ones that get to real reality? It would seem that there are several real realities according to Dennett's basic views on the intentional stance um, and, uh, and their uh, connection with his, his views on uh, evolution. Dennett's theory of mind seems to point towards a pluralistic ontology where different kinds of minds are associated with different ways of world making. This naturally borders on relativism and he himself refrains from taking such a step. Uh, and this is where he resorts to the contrast between manifest image and scientific image. I am not sure that it works. Many questions remain um, unanswered about whether this should be done as he does it. And this is it, a glimpse of Bennett that should have taken 40 minutes. I'm sorry it took more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia, for this very interesting and very stimulating talk. Um, we have six minutes for questions. Um, so six minutes, and then after uh, we have Richard talking, but then after there are also, there is the possibility to have more discussion. But so if somebody has a quick question, then we can do that now. David, do you have a question or is that an applause? It is an, an applause. It's an applause. Okay. <laughs> but what I what I what I um, didn't hear was what you thought about all of that, Sophia. <laughs> Um, I have problems with Dennett's philosophical style, okay, the, um, in, in the sense that, as I said at the beginning, I'm not sure whether Dennett is doing philosophy of science and I, or science, and I think this is a question that matters, even though what he ultimately intends to be doing is philosophy of science, philosophy of cognitive science. So, um, Dennett says of himself, what I think of himself is that, he, of him, is that he cannot be both a Quinean which is what he's ultimately uh, takes himself as being, and that's the ultimate support of his views on, uh, on ontology. And even though Quine himself has a more complicated view on why one should be a physicalist, then it resorts to, to a Quinean-like view of ontology to, uh, let's say, sort out the, the, the relativist threats of, uh, of his own views of, of mind. So then it intends to be a Quinean. Uh, but he intends to be um, to be a Quinian at the same time as, as he himself uh, puts puts it um, as he is a, a Wittgensteinian res, uh, resorting to descriptions of the mental. So the whole the whole idea of um, uh, he at some point even says that uh, the philosophical investigations so Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations should teach us how to do philosophy of mind. So this is. This is the, the, the methodological approach that, um, uh, that one 
um, should take in doing, uh, in doing philosophy of mind. And then he sharpens that up with his uh, view of the intentional stance. He thinks coherently. I don't think that these two parts uh, of, of Dennett's approach to mind, so the, the physicalist Quinean uh, view, he thinks as a monist physicalist and, and a view uh, of ontology, which is not relativist, and uh, a, a view of mind which uh, starts as Wittgensteinian descriptivist and definitely uh, with the idea of kinds of minds and uh, the uh, exploration of the evolutionary backings of what a kind of mind is uh, leads to a, a many uh, a many worlds view. So to clearly to uh, the existence of plural ontologies. I don't think this about, if you ask me about what I think about Dennett, I don't think this is uh, ultimately coherent. So uh, I don't think one can go both ways um, as Dennett thinks uh, he can. But um, this, what we, we want to say depends on what we want to do doing theory of mind. I think Dennett has extremely interesting ideas about cognition and, uh, and, about, and about mind, except I, 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 I would uh, think of them as closer in fact, and, uh, and they are closer to uh, evolutionary approaches in cognitive science than to um, the kind of discussions that go on in philosophy of mind. And another big problem uh, is um, what does this does mean in terms of uh, philosophy of language. And so what philosophy and analytic philosophy uses um, uh, or takes language to be when it comes to a philosophical investigation. I don't think that what Dennett is talking about is language in the sense uh, that um, that is um, that language is essential for a philosophical investigation in, let's say, analytic philosophy as if it was conceived to be. So this would, should ultimately bear, for instance, in what he says about Grice, because I think the idea of reverse engineering is uh, very interesting and very critical of uh, much literature that is very often taken to be simply there, and, uh, like like Spare Merwin Wilson uh, view of uh, of communication and Dennett's criticisms are are good, but um, I don't know if that's um, uh, all that should be said about um, methodological uses of language in. Uh, um, in doing philosophy. Then it puzzles me about the, the question, what doing philosophy is. I, I don't even know when I take one of his books if this is philosophy. And of course you can ask me, why does that matter? Uh, but. Thank you very much, Sophia. It's it really reached the hour. I know that there are questions and comments from uh, JT and uh, Paulo Abrantos and um, Amadeo, but let's do that after the next speaker. Let's let's first go to Richard and then in the breakout rooms, we can continue this discussion. Thank you very much, Sophia, for your uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. And now we are moving on to um, uh, Richard Tyson, who is here. So this is uh, good news. We have a new book in the in the either series, the interdisciplinary evolution research series of which I am um, the editor-in-chief. This is a book series that we have with Springer, Springer Nature. And uh, we are about to have a new book published, which is on biosemiotics. And that book was edited by Richard Tyson Simanke and Elena Pagny. And so Elena is not uh, here with us today. She was unable to join, but so Elena, she has a background in philosophy. She graduated from the University of Pisa in Italy, and then she did her PhD from the University of Florence. And uh, later she worked at the University of Firenze. And then uh, also in uh, France, she worked at the Sandra Cavaillet. And uh, then she moved to Brazil, and there she works now as a visiting process professor at the Department of Philosophy of the Institute of Human Sciences at the Federal University of Juiz de Fora. And there uh, she also met Richard, and Richard, he studied uh, at the University, uh, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, 
and later at the University of San Carlos. And he also doctorate in philosophy from the University of Sao Paulo. And right now he is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the Federal University of Juiz de Fora in Brazil. And there he focuses on metapsychology, psychoanalysis and phenomenology. And so uh, he's here with us today, Richard, hello. And uh, please go oh. ahead. Oh, hello. Uh... I think my, I'm afraid my, my internet connection is a little, a little bit unstable right now, but I hope it gets better uh, soon. We can uh, uh, okay. Uh, well, well, thank you very much, Natalie, for the invitation to speak here and to know the group. It's been uh, really, uh, really interesting. And um, uh, oh, it's a shame that Elena Ellen can be here today because uh, I'm afraid the book is uh let me say 70 percent hers uh, and only 30 percent uh, mine at most uh but anyway i'll do my best and um, i haven't prepared a, a presentation because uh, it's difficult to present a, a, a collection because it has, it has so many so many different uh, contributions about uh, many different topics uh, uh, organized around this general uh, subject of uh, uh, biosemiotics and, and, and evolution. Um, so I think, I think the best way to present the, the idea of the book is to tell a little bit about the history of, uh, about how uh, this book came to be, which it has some, 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 some strange features. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, many, many senses, I think it's, it's this book emerged from a, a set of, um, Kind of unlikely circumstances, but uh, uh, anyway, so I'm going to tell a little bit about the history of the book, and uh, um, uh, after that, I, I, I'm going to say some things about what I think. Uh, um, uh, maybe first about this relationship that is in the title of the book between biosemiotics and evolution, uh, 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 and also. Uh, and this has to be with uh, the be uh, my background uh, and the Elena background as uh, researchers. Was the, the, the these two these two um, topics appeal? What uh, what the appeal of this of biosemiotics and this in this relationship with evolution to uh, uh, what uh, are our um, um, let's say most. Uh, um, central uh, uh, research interest because uh, Elena, as you uh, could uh, see, she comes from a, a, a philosophical education and from a research in phenomenology. And uh, 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 she was first an Aristotelian scholar and, and then the work with the relationship between uh, um, uh, uh, Aristotle's philosophy and phenomenology. And then she went to study the uh, uh, in her first post doctorate uh, uh, the relationship between uh, phenomenology of life and the biological uh, and philosophical problem of individuality, and we it was with this 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 subject that she that that we met we had met uh, ten more than ten years ago at a phenomenology conference in the United States. And then uh, she came to, to do a second postdoctorate with me uh, at the Federal University of Jesus. For at first, at first, with uh, uh, this uh, to 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 follow her, her studies in, in, in the problem of individuality, individuality, and uh, uh, we worked together on phenomenological issues concerning nature, animality. Uh, uh, phenomenology of life, uh, uh, and uh, but my background on the other side is uh, history and philosophy of science, uh, and uh, uh, especially history and philosophy of the science of the mind, as you said, psychology, uh, psychoanalysis, psychiatry, sometimes. So I, 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 I think uh, maybe I, I, I would like to say some words uh, about how I think the biosemiotics and uh, evolutionary theory appeal to these uh, two uh, uh, theoretical and research uh, uh, background in terms of research interests. 
but biosemiotics appeal to phenomenology for someone who uh, uh, is interested in phenomenological philosophy and uh, what uh, it's the appeal of biosemiotics uh, for history and philosophy of science. Because, uh, um, um, first of all, for, for someone who studies phenomenology, especially more contemporary phenomenology, when we can find uh, a lot of developments concerning a, a phenomenological approach to nature, to natural sciences, uh, to life itself, and uh, uh, there, is, uh, there is, for example, uh, environmental philosophy of uh, phenomenological orientation. And the, I, I think one of the, the common uh, features of all these this, uh, phenomenological approaches is try to, is try to, to, to to break with a, a tradition which, uh, which is both metaphysical and epistemological that attributes meaning and symbolism and uh, 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 um, uh, signs, uh, uh, all this, this, this kind of, uh, of semiotic uh, uh, entities and devices only to human culture. And in the world of nature, we should have only uh, mechanical causes or something like this. I think this is a, this is a, in many, in many places, I think this in Brazil, it is still a very uh, uh, controversial issue. I think in other university, uh, universitarian context, this, uh, this question is better settled, but in, in Brazil, it's still, people are still very fond of this dichotomy between natural sciences on the one hand and, and um, uh, human or social sciences on the other hand. So this discussion is still important, uh, uh, even though I think it shouldn't be anymore, but anyway. Um, and so the, our first uh, common interest in biosemiotics came from this, from, because if there is a, a place where um, epistemological concerns relating to the difference or to the organization, the cartography of the of the field of scientific activity uh, and what the place uh, 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 of the sciences and disciplines that uh, deal with uh, human reality and human life and the products of human action on the one hand and nature on the other hand. So uh, uh, um, biosemiotics for the, someone with this background, with this kind of interest, offers an opportunity to uh, uh, challenges, to challenge this, um, this long established categories. And uh, of course, because from a biosemiotic point of view, meaning is not a human invention. Meaning is not meaning, meaning symbolism, signs uh, uh, are not human inventions. They are inherent in nature itself. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, we can uh, find in the evolutionary perspective, regardless of the specific kind of evolutionary theory uh, in question, we can find a, 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 a theoretical background to explain how these capacities, how this uh, symbolic, how these uh, 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 semiotic capacities uh, 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 appear emerge in the history of life. And um, on the other hand, on the other hand, for someone who's, who's interested in the in the uh, uh, in the history and philosophy of the sciences of the mind, as is my case, uh, uh, the the biosemiotics provide a framework. Uh, uh, within which we can challenge this long, uh, uh, this familiar, but uh, in many ways uh, already strongly anachronic division of the field of uh, scientific activ activity uh, between 
natural science on the one hand and uh, uh, human science or social sciences on the other hand. Um, but there is more because uh, at first, at first uh, the, the main uh, subject of the book was biosemiotics. Uh, um, evolution came in the process of organizing uh, the book, uh, mainly because many of the contributions deal uh, uh, um, um, with um, evolutionary uh, issues and concerns. But when, if you look more closely to the relationship of this, of this two, two, let us say, uh, uh, paradigms to approach uh, uh, life and uh, the field of uh, biological research, we can maybe uh, at, uh, this relationship be between biosemiotic and evolution, biosemiotics and evolution has something to benefit both fields. And that's, a, I, 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 that's I think, maybe the more uh, general uh, interest of the book as a whole, regardless the specific topics concerning every individual, every individual contribution. Because when you think there's the, the biosemiotics paradigm in life science for the study of life, organism, living being. On the other side, you have, on the other hand, you have more let us say mainstream biology, what I suppose it's still mainstream biology with a still uh, uh, um, uh, um, characterized by a more uh, causal approach, um, mechanist approach. I mean, it, even when it's still, uh, when it's, uh, it admits or reserves some place for teolo teleology, teleology is, uh, uh, um, I still think of uh, this uh, uh, palace that uh, uh, govern the life processes as somehow causally determined. So, on the other hand, on one hand, biosemiotics provide a very strong theoretical model to avoid certain traps, certain, certain epistemological traps of more traditional biological approaches. But on the other hand, biosemiotics, I think, runs the, uh, 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 the risk of returning certain, let us say, pre-scientific views of life. I mean, it's when you regard meaning as an essential feature of life processes. And you regard that meaning is a fundamental feature of the life world and not only a human creation, that the behavior of non-human species is to a certain extent at least governed by meaning relations and not only by causal relations you run with the risk to reestablish or to return to, uh, for example, uh, 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 a romantic view of nature, a metaphysical view of nature, uh, nature as a, 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 a kind of um, a, a spirit, uh, soul of the world, a world soul, as Schiller famously put. Oh, the, 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 the spirit of everything, as, as, as Schelling, Schelling called the nature, uh, the, the, the soul of the world, Schiller said that it was the, the geist of, the, the geist dissolved, the, the, the spirit of everything. Of everything. Uh, every now and then we stumble upon uh, uh, some biosemiotics from your image 
a, a, a very similar, is, let's say, speculative, romantic, uh, 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 vitalist in the, in the sense of a, a, a purely metaphysical uh, 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 vitalism, which can no longer be regarded as uh, uh, compatible with the scientific uh, uh, worldview contemporary. And uh, um, I think this pa pairing, pairing uh, biosemiotics with an evolutionary approach to, 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 to life, to organisms and to nature as a whole is a way that we can avoid this traps that may be entangled in the idea that uh, life is in itself meaningful, that meaning is inherent in life. Because an evolutionary approach can uh, give us uh, uh, tools, theoretical, methodological tools, instruments to make sense of how these semiotic capacities have evolved in the history of life. And uh, that uh, uh, to say that meaning is inherent in nature doesn't imply that there is meaning in nature in exactly, in exactly the same way, or in exactly the same sense that there is meaning in the human cultural products. There is meaning, you can say, oh, okay, there is meaning in nature. The relationship between two, two organisms, between a predator and its prey, uh, uh, the way uh, the, the, uh, 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 a prey and a predator relate significantly to their environments is semiotically different because they interpret their walls differently. So yes, this is a very uh, uh, fruitful, a very uh, uh, promising, a very uh, uh, um, uh, uh, epistemologically integrating uh, uh, intrigating way of seeing it life and explaining uh, its phenomena. But if you keep in mind that um, this meaning, when you're talking meaning in this sense, and uh, 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 related to non-human species and how they work, how they function in their worlds, in their environments, and the, their relations to each other is not exactly the same meaning that we can find in human cultural productions and literature in art and in law and but of course it's not that's that two different and separate and incompatible worlds of meaning because if uh, 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 it was so we would have returned to a more traditional way of seeing the human world as separated from nature, as a part from nature, uh, and not uh, as an exception in the natural order, as uh, uh, the more humanistic uh, oh, social constructionist approaches to the human world in its relation to nature uh, 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 claim. So we have meaning in nature. We have uh, symbols in nature, we have signs in nature and explaining life, explaining living beings behavior, explaining living beings very existence implies, requires, entails to make sense of this meaningful relationships with this symbolic relationships. Of, uh, 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 it's not uh, the human being that is a symbolic species, our species are to some extent symbolic, even though in different ways, uh, 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 the human being is a symbolic spe species. But uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, in a way that can be, but in a sort of continuity uh, between human and non-human uh, uh, symbiosis, symbiosis, okay? Uh, 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 non-human animals, uh, behave and uh, re regulate their behavior through meaningful relationships to each other, to their environments, 
human animals to the same. And there's a certain history in, in, the, in the evolution of life that may explain how from one kind of semiotic activity, we uh, 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 obtain or another kind, and specifically human kind of semiotic activity emerge and came to be in the life world. So I think this is one of the uh, one of the main advantage when you pair when you put together evolutionary approaches and biosemiotic approaches to uh, uh, life phenomena, to uh, uh, ecology, to etology, to biology of behavior, and to all these fields of uh, uh, biological inquiry that approach those aspects of life that are more strictly, more closely related to uh, uh, science and meaning. On the other hand, from the perspective of um, um, an evolutionary approach to life, what's the benefit with, uh, of being paired, being put together with uh, biosemiotics? I think one of the main, one of the main advantage of, from the perspective of uh, evolutionary theories that this association with biosemiotics can provide can pro, can, can provide some 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 uh, uh, conceptual tools to criticize to 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 critically approach some trends in evolutionary theory that tend to reestablish a sort of uh, not only dogmatic, but also a sort of mechanistic view of life. Some interpretations of uh, neo-Darwinism, ultra-Darwinism, and these uh, 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 versions of this interpretation of uh, evolutionary theory that uh, uh, resulted or that are part, resulted for the uh, synthetic theory of evolution historically and the new synthesis that took place uh, uh, after that, the, the new synthesis of uh, uh, sociobiology, for example, in the 1970s, which presented itself as a new synthesis, a further synthesis uh, 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 with respect to the uh, uh, first uh, synthetic theory of evolution that uh, 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 appear in the in 1920s and 1930s. Also, uh, some interpretations of evolutionary theory and some interpretations of the evolution of life that uh, 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 are related to this paradigm uh, uh, sometimes tend to be very strict, very dogmatic, very exclusively, very, very, very exclusive and exclusively uh, 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 explaining life phenomena in terms of uh, a certain particular application of the hypothesis of natural selection uh, and uh, label themselves as a Darwinistic approach, but it's not uh, uh, exactly a Darwinistic, a Darwinian approach uh, since uh, Darwin's own view of evolution was much more pluralistic and uh, uh, accepted, uh, uh, admitted many different uh, uh, mechanisms at, uh, at, uh, at in action in the course of life's evolution. So I think that when uh, uh, approach to biosemiotics, evolutionary, evolutionary thinking uh, may find ways to uh, uh, return to a more pluralistic uh, uh, approach to the evolution of life and thus avoid also the traps of uh, uh, these uh, more mechanistic views of uh, 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 evolution from this ultra Darwinian perspective. So I think, I think this is the main point, the main mutual benefit that 
uh, uh, I think it can can uh, we, we can obtain can be obtained when pairing a biosemiotics approach to life and uh, uh, um, uh, 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 an evolutionary approach to 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 life. Biosemiotic uh, uh, sees life as an intrinsically an inherently meaningful phenomenon and sees life as a system of, uh, 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 of uh, meanings and signs that need to be, in, uh, life is interpretation of signs. And, 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 and sorry, I, I think my, I hope my, my, my internet connection gets a little bit better uh, soon, but I'm, I'm already concluding. Yeah. Uh, a little bit better now. Uh, just check it. it. It was a, a little better. Um, so I think so. Just to conclude, I think this is the main uh, for 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 someone interested interested in phenomenology and interested in uh, uh, um, uh, giving science a phenomenological uh, uh, approach, understand or using phenomenology to think critically. Uh, 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 um, uh, about uh, uh, current scientific uh, trends. I think biosemiotics provides a very, it's a scientific paradigm, it's not a philosophical one, and a very interesting scientific paradigm. It has very interesting features and very fruitful epistemologically and even, metaph even metaphysically. But it runs this, it runs this risk of uh, Returning to a pre-scientific uh, uh, view of the bi of biological phenomena, a romantic, a metaphysical. Dictionary theory is a very strong scientific uh, paradigm. Oh, it's getting worse again. And uh, but. Uh, in some of its uh, trends, it has become dogmatic, mechanistic, uh, exclusivist, uh, and so forth. I think this, this approach to biosemiotics bio can uh, uh, provide uh, uh, insights so that uh, evolutionary thinking can be more pluralistic, can uh, 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 put challenge, can challenge, can, can challenge evolutionary thinking so that uh, 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 it is forced to, uh, 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 to, to abandon its, uh, let us say, comfort zones and, uh, and uh, uh, push uh, uh, towards its frontiers, its border, and enlarge and uh, uh, um, uh, walk uh, towards a, a more encompassing view of life. So I think it is this, this, this mutual benefit uh, between uh, uh, of this, this approximation between biosemiotic, most important uh, uh, paradigms in uh, contemporary life science. I think it's the, this mutual benefit. I think it's, the, it's the, 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 the main feature of uh, that appear in the many uh, different essays, many different contributions in our, in our, in our book. Okay, uh, uh, um, uh, um, when you deal with evolution, for example, when you deal with the evolution of design, one, one of, the, one of the, the, the contributions about the evolution of design. When you think about design, you think uh, of something where uh, uh, the idea pre-exists the thing. Think, think something is thought of first and then a build and then appear as an object in the world. So uh, to talk about design in the life world, in the life world, made easily leads you to a, a, a idealistic uh, uh, philosophy of life, such as, uh, for example, uh, Schelling's and other uh, 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 idealistic philosophers. Uh, but if you ground this approach uh, uh, in the evolutionary uh, view of life, you can avoid this uh, philosophical traps. And this is just an example. I think other contributions in the book may give other examples of how uh, this uh, uh, approximation is fruitful and how it can be mutually beneficial, both for the field of biosemiotics and for the field 
of evolutionary thinking and uh, uh, also to this uh, uh, idea that uh, the study of, the, of human life, of human culture, of the products of human cultural life, of human um, technology uh, uh, don't need uh, uh, to be uh, studied uh, uh, starting from an exclusively an exclusive epistemology, an exceptionalist epistemology, but can be uh, uh, um, included in a more encompassing view of the world of life as a whole. And uh, we can find ways of uh, 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 studying human life from the, let us say, a naturalistic point of view without uh, uh, purging it, without uh, cutting off everything that is interesting in the human world and that makes the specificity of the human species in the world, which is its specific forms of language, uh, um, uh, uh, its cultural life, uh, its cultural institutions, and all the other things that make, uh, that make uh, human species a very uh, uh, intriguing uh, characteristic uh, of the natural world, but not necessarily something outside the natural world. I, I think that's how I, I, I'm sorry that my internet uh, connection uh, uh, made some parts of what I say. I hope, uh, uh, I hope uh, it was possible to give, uh, what, uh, to, 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 to pass what is my view of the, 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 what the, the central uh, uh, question that is at stake in this relationship between biosemiotics and evolutionary thinking. I'm sure Elena would have uh, many other, probably more interesting thing, things to do with the shame that she couldn't be here, but this uh, is more or less what I would have to say about uh, our book uh, uh, right now. Uh, and thank you, thank you very much for, for, for the invitation again. Thank you, thank you very much for, 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 for the, your attention. Thank you very much, Richard, uh, for this uh, presentation of, of the book. Are there any questions? So um, the book is almost available with Springer, with Springer Nature. And um, then I think there's a question here, yes. Um, and then um, I think, in fact, I don't know, Richard, do you know when it is going to come out? Because you can already buy it, but and uh, the proofs have already gone by. Yeah. The authors have already gotten the proofs, and you can already buy it. But so you know, it could be any any moment. But do you have any more data on that about when the they, book will be published? They said it will be available in November. November. Oh yeah. Yes. So November, and there's a question from JT. Oh, thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Richard. Could, could I just ask? Uh, your preferred definition of sign and symbol? Yes, uh, uh, biosemiotics uh, works uh, 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 mostly for very Piercean definition of, 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 of sign of which a symbol would be a special case. I don't think it uh, needs to be the only definition. I think symbol uh, thing else it's the most uh, the most uh, the broader definition you can you can give a uh, 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 something that can be as, as a um, as a symbol i think there are many many ways of uh, of defining the biosemiotic in particular uh, it emerged from the application of Piercian. Uh, the only, it needs to be the only I'm sorry, Richard, you, you, you are breaking up. Are you hearing me? I think you're frozen. Yeah, you were frozen, but I, I think am. you're back. Sorry, my, my. No, I, I, yeah, I'm back. Uh, um, let, let, let me begin again. 
uh, try to begin again. Uh, uh, so biosemiotics works with this Pearson semiotics. It comes from the application of, of Pearson uh, semiotics to, 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 to biology. And uh, um, I don't know. We hear you. Aren't you? Are you listening to me? We hear you at this moment. We ah, okay. hear you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but uh, but uh, but I, I I I don't think I don't think it it needs to be the only way. I think it's, it it has been the the the, the definition of sign and the symbol that uh, uh, is uh, most often assumed within the field of biosimilar. I don't think it needs to be the only. I think there are other. But the the problem is uh, usually. Uh, 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 approaches, for example, to human, human behavior, to human society that uh, make uh, uh, symbolism a central feature tend most often to, to, to endorse uh, this dualistic approach that human culture has nothing to do with nature. And so, so far, I think the biosimilarity approach, which uses, which has used uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, Pearson uh, uh, view of signs and symbols uh, 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 is the, the is the, the the most uh, the most common, I think. But I think other 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 views. I think there are uh, cognitive uh, 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 approaches to, to to symbolism that are very much compatible with uh, with uh, an naturalistic approach to to the problem of meaning and to to the the, 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 the problem of this the symbolic interchanges between between uh, living organisms, not necessarily human organisms. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I answer your question. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. And so the book will be available uh, from November onwards. And I suggest that we uh, end this session, the official part uh, here. And then next month, uh, we have more papers from the special issue that we are doing uh, for Topoi. So we have Selena Arfini, who is going to talk, and uh, Lorenzo Magnani. And this will be mid-November, sometime mid-November. So on this note, I want to thank the speakers very kindly. And uh, um, I hope to see you uh, next month. Bye. So now I'm going to stop.